Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the school board meeting this evening. Uh, we are glad to welcome all of our visitors. Uh, we're going to begin tonight, uh, before we begin our formal agenda, we're going to start with our spotlight. And we have two spotlights tonight. We are going to honor our friends from STEP, and we really appreciate their, be their being here tonight. And we're also going to honor some special guests from Cargill, and uh, we want to welcome them here tonight also. So I will begin with Step. And Camille, you want to meet me up there? I want to take a few minutes here for a special welcome to our friends from STEP. Uh, Camille Schroeder and Eileen Enzi are here. And one of the things that STEP does for us that is very special is prior to school starting, they get together and they put together packets for our kids. The teachers put out a list. And they say, this is what we need. And then we have a number of children who, for several reasons, uh, cannot afford uh, to buy those things. What STEP does is they step in and they fulfill the needs for these children. I think it's absolutely incredible. And we want to thank STEP tonight. and. Uh, Camille and I are old neighbors, so we've known each other for a long time. Uh, but Camille, would you, and Eileen, would you like to say a few words sure. on behalf of how you go about this, how you put it together, and, and again, we're so grateful for what you do for these kids. So if you could say a few words, we'd appreciate it. I'd be glad to. Of course, it's my passion as a retired teacher to see that kids have school supplies. So when I retired in 1998, I came over to STEP and started working with the program, and I've worked with it for 15 years. And it has evolved along with Eileen's help, and we've, we work together really well. We each do a part of the program, and it gets done. We, in the spring, or in May and June, get the lists that are put out from the schools, and we're so glad they put them out then. We look at the lists, find out how many pencils they need, how many notebooks they need, how many uh, dry erase markers they need. We then find out the kids are registered at STEP. They're all registered. They're pre-approved. They are the children of the clients of STEP, those who qualify. And they are listed by school and by grade. And we look and find out how many we have at Aquila in grade two. And we assemble that many bags for them. And when they come on that wonderful Monday, which uh, your superintendent visited uh, to pick up their bags, it is incredibly, it's just fantastic. They come and they, they, we know who they are, and we say, OK, Johnny, you're third grade at Aquila. Here is your bag. And we think they have the best supplies ever, because believe me, we have gone all over the city, right? Absolutely. <laughs> we shop. In fact, right now, I have a whole car full of school supplies for next year that people have donated. And so they get what they need. Ticonderoga pencils, don't forget it. You can't have the regular ones. It's Ticonderoga, you teachers. And uh, certain kind of plastic folders, and believe me, we shop for them. And last year, uh, we served 400 St. Louis Park children, 364 who were uh, students in the public schools in St. Louis Park. The program is open to anybody who lives in St. Louis Park. And I believe we had. Let's see, I have to think. Uh, 30 different schools that the children went to. And so we look for their lists and get what they need. It is, it is tremendously rewarding. And if you ever have free time on a Monday when we're distributing, please come and help us. The program runs totally on volunteers. There is no input except figures and stuff from the step office. And volunteers do it all. They pack the bags, they sort the stuff, they they do all those things. It's a great program, and we're proud to do it. 
And uh, as a former teacher, it's so nice when those kids come to school on day one with what they need. Oh, and I should say something. I just want to add one thing. Uh, I have an associate who is my husband, Paul, and in, in a district-wide memo, it was said this 93-year-old man, he's really only 92. Oh. But, but to that is he, he was a principal in St. Louis Park and actually opened Westwood when, when Westwood opened low these many years ago. And, uh, and he was assistant here when this opened, too. So we kind of have history with the schools. And Bruce, I'm going to interrupt and say, I'm sorry, sorry I got your age <laughs> wrong there. But I was so impressed. I was there watching this distribution. And it was one of those 100 degree days. I mean, it was literally 100 degrees, I think. Yeah. And he was sitting outside the entire time <laughs> helping people find the right door and, and find their car right. and find a place to park. And it was. Yeah. I was totally amazed. So, great work. Maybe she should tell what she does. So. Really? Yeah. Well, um, I don't know what this is. Camille is the brains, and I'm the brawn. <laughs> so, I uh, she knows which school wants 96 uh, pencils for each student, and I I count those pencils out. Uh, I shop till I drop, literally, and uh, she remembers which school, which grade asks for four-inch terracotta pots. I mean, this whole thing, I don't understand how she does it. She's a computer. So uh, we have fun doing it. It is always 100 degrees with, during back-to-school pass-out, and uh, there is no air conditioning where I work either. So pray for us. <laughs> this is our presentation. Uh, the St. Louis Park Public Schools recognition, the Board of Education of St. Louis Park Schools recognizes STEP of St. Louis Park for their generosity of donation of school supplies in 2013. And it's signed by the superintendent and myself as chair. Uh, again, STEP does so much for this community. We can't say thank you enough for feeding our children, for clothing them, and for, for putting these school supplies in their hands. We are very grateful. Thank you all. At this time, we also have a special recognition of our friends from Cargill. Uh, and I say our friends from Cargill because I go back a long way from Cargill. They don't know this, but I used to audit Cargill <laughs> back in my other life. Uh, Cargill is a wonderful organization, a tremendous asset to the state of Minnesota, and quite frankly, to the world. Tradex and the things that they do around the world uh, keep food flowing for in incredible numbers of people. And uh, it was a, a joy just to be a part of all that in my small way as an auditor. Uh, but what goes around comes around. And I, I want to welcome uh, Lori Woodrick and Eric Lill from Cargill. And Lori and Eric, uh, if you'd come up, please. And uh, Angie, can you come up, too? And uh, I had a wonderful experience. Uh, we just had a technology fair at, uh, over at Aquila School this past weekend. And we went around to the various things. I mean, the things we do in technology are absolutely amazing. But the people who were part of the grant from Cargill were wearing their coats, their lab coats. And uh, Sarah Peterson was doing an experiment with temperature. And so, uh, I got to hold on to the probe and watch from the room temperature to my 98.6 to watch it rise. And the things the kids are doing and what Cargill is doing for us is taking teachers from the high school and moving them down into our elementary schools. So our STEM program, our science, technology, engineering, and math, that our kids are getting 
integrated with high school teachers so that they meet these teachers in the elementary school and then they're mentored all the way up. And this is a tremendous program. And Car Cargill not only supported us in the initial phases of the grant, but they have also continued the grant. And I'm very grateful for that. So, Angie, you want to yes. tell us more? Thank yes. you. So a, a couple other pieces. So Cargill, in particular, um, in terms of Cargill Cares, um, came to us when we have this new model in place. They came to say, kind of, what are the other barriers? What are the other needs we have? And similar to the school supplies, junior high and senior high have needs. And our needs are expensive. Like, we need scientific calculators at $150 each and we have these really expensive needs and and Cargill really stepped up and said give us the list of things that we need not you know that are kind of um as much for elementary and they have done fantastic things very parallel to kind of you know what step has done but based on the administrators so we go to the administration kind of district wide and say what are the needs that that your buildings have and your students have and so we once again have these tremendous resources for the students to be able to use um, as we continue to really kind of embed science in the high school but with that Lori and Eric you can touch piece on kind of things that you've done okay. Um, I'm Lori Woodrich, Eric Lill, and I are co-chairs of the Carl Cares Twin City Council, and we're the co-chairs of the Education Committee. We have education, environment, and nutrition. Um, Eric and I, uh, it's all volunteer. We do a lot of hours, but, uh, and our two cohorts, uh, Deanna Bunkelman and Diane Karp, we are all uh, children of teachers. So that's kind of where our passion, that's why we, Eric and I got involved, and then we got Deanna and Diane involved. Um, but we know, I mean, I know firsthand that how much teachers pay out of pockets for supplies. And if the kids don't have it, the teachers go buy it, they give it to them. So we, and we get to come up with our own ideas and where we give our support, and we have a budget every year. And then we also go asking, begging for <laughs> money from our different business units. So we've been really lucky. It's been really rewarding. We get a lot of our other uh, coworkers involved, and we, um, like Andrea said, we go in and say, what do you need? What do the school teachers need? What is the bigger needs? And we've given, uh, this last year, we gave $3,000 worth of backpacks. And uh, last year before that, we gave $5,000 worth of the calculators, along with the pencils and the, the folders and the everything else. So it's, it's been really rewarding. So, thanks. Well, I'll keep it short, but uh, yeah, I remember my, my, I always remember my mom grading papers. Wherever we were, she was always grading papers or something. So yeah, being a, a child of a teacher is very impactful. But uh, Cargill moved into the neighborhood uh, where the old Super Value Warehouse was just a few years ago, and now that's Excelsior Crossings. And one of the things Cargill always likes to do is serve the community in which they work. And School Supply Drive was a perfect opportunity to serve St. Louis Park and Hopkins, and we were very happy to be able to do it. Well, I think kind of in our closing, I'm just really excited that we continue to have this ongoing relationship with, with Cargill and kind of we share the community and share our students and it's really lovely to be able to call, you know, an organization and say, yeah, could we have $5,000 worth of calculators <laughs> and actually have them say, okay, you know, so it's really, you know, lovely and they know that they're going to good use and our students are really using them in a beautiful way. So it's real exciting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can you be in the picture? <laughs> Come on, Angie, sure. you be in the picture. I'm going to do two. Awesome. All right. Yeah, I don't want to wait for it. Oh, great placement. One, three. One, two, three. One more. One, two, three. Thank you so much. And now we will get into our formal agenda. And I know you would all love to stay through a school board meeting, but if you feel that you have to leave, we do understand. And thank you for coming.
Okay, now we will get into our formal agenda. First is our call to order, which is right now. Uh, the agenda, formal agenda, will be approved by the members of the school board. Uh, the study session topics tonight are the I-3 grant update. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the referendum update. Uh, number three, Peter Hobart construction update. Uh, number four, general obligation school building refunding bonds. Uh, then policy development, first readings on a number of different policies tonight, and then second readings on three policies that we discussed last time. Uh, finally, the action agenda, there'll be approval of policies for the second reading, uh, then the uh, approval of the resolu resolution awarding the sale of general obligation school building refunding bonds, the approval of a resolution authorizing the closing of the Elliott purchase and sale, and we'll have one addenda to the uh, agenda tonight on the action agenda. We'll also approve, uh, before this meeting, Nancy and I uh, got together and interviewed a candidate for the Human Rights Commission, uh, and we'll approve uh, him after discussion tonight. So uh, we will propose to approve after our discussion tonight. Uh, so that that is uh, our agenda. Uh, finally, communications and transmission, transmittals, and then adjournment. Uh, can I have a motion to approve the amended agenda? So moved. Moved by Larry, second? Second. Second by Nancy. All those in favor, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. We have a 5 0 vote. Now into our study session topics. Uh, the first item will be the I 3 grant update. Uh, Angie Jerbeck and Justin Barbeau. Well, good evening, and thanks so much for having us here. Um, we'll kind of summarize what we've been doing. I actually had shared with Rob, it becomes interesting when um, we are sharing more nationally than we are locally, so it does feel a bit remiss that others aren't aware of some of the things that we are doing. Justin and I actually will be presenting at the National Dropout Conference in Atlanta um, in a couple of weeks, and we're receiving kind of more and more invitations. So we'll give a really brief 20-minute summary of what we've done and certainly kind of be open to, to taking questions but i want to just kind of bring you up to speed um, just so i can be clear justin is the i3 coordinator at the high school and i am the i3 director of the overall project so we'll kind of hit a couple lenses there so the presentation that we're going to cover today so we're going to talk a little bit about the research about the i should even explain the title so i had called this the ninth grade program because that seemed like that was the right thing and the rest of the world calls it the building assets reducing risks model so you will see that language interchangeable that'll be the first you know local versus kind of national implication. So we'll talk a little bit about the research, as well as um, talk about it in the context of the social emotional learning frameworks, as well as talk about the eight strategies. And just so there can be an, an awareness of kind of some of the national things, um, you will see we're already listed in NREP, the National Registry of Evidence-Based Practices and Programs. We have been for four years. Um, three weeks ago, I was contacted by the What Works Clearinghouse, and they're considering um, the model right now, and last Friday was contacted by CASEL, which is um, the other national clearinghouse for social emotional learning programs. So um, neither CASEL or What Works Clearinghouse is an organization that you can contact, they find you. So we certainly are kind of amidst, amidst kind of the national awareness of the work that we've been all started right here. In terms of the work that we've done, there really is kind of two main pillars to it. And those that have, you know, live in park should know that these pillars are what we live by, but now we're purporting them to others. And one is the um, relationships. It's positive, intentional relationships, staff to staff, staff to students, and students to students. The whole model is based on Peter Benson's work in the developmental assets. So that is the undergirding and the theoretical framework that everything is based on. But you'll see that there's intentional strategies for those relationships to be in place. And the second pillar is data. And so those two have to be really tightly wed, that you need to be having these leverages that these relationships that you can leverage, but it has to be glued to real time data. And everything we do, you'll see has weekly data loops in terms of how we are um, interfacing with students and how we're interfacing with staff. But those are kind of the, the two pieces. 
In terms of kind of what it is, um, it's an educational model. It's not a program. I've been corrected multiple times. So I have to quit calling it a program. Because a program is something you can put in and take out. And this is a model on how schools operate. So it's an educational model that's effective in um, helping low achieving students. It's been now shown um, to decrease the achievement gap. And it also has been shown to increase teacher effectiveness. Um, and we'll get into these studies. And so right now, as you know, we have an I-3 development grant. Um, this past summer, I did write for two other grants, which we'll wait and see you know, when we find out after the government opens up. Um, we wrote for both another, um, another development grant, which would take that ninth grade system and make it a ninth through 12th grade system. And the schools that would be doing that would be um, St. Louis Park again, the three partnering schools we have, two in Maine and one in Hemet. And we would all be working on what would a 9-12 system be looking like using these systems. And we pick up a fifth school to test it in. And so that's one of the grants that I wrote. And the second grant is to take this ninth grade system and have it go into 60 schools on the north um, east, which is a little overwhelming. But um, <laughs> and they would do extensive studies on 60 more schools um, to you know, really see how um, much this continue to kind of hold up to more studies as well as broader implementation. why the um, system is being looked at. So um, one in three high school students currently don't graduate. Um, an estimated 420,000 young people do not graduate from 2,000 lowest performing schools. And these schools really exist in all environments, you know, urban, rural, and suburban. And so one of the things that the current I3 site has is we are working in very diverse communities. We, um, St. Louis Park is considered suburban. The two sites in Maine are considered rural. And then the site in California is considered an urban school. It's right outside Los Angeles. So they wanted to see if you could take this model and put it in different settings on both coasts as well as different geographies and see what the implementation would look like. So once again, some more data on ninth grade. So why the focus on ninth grade? So currently right now, 20 to 40% of ninth grade students still fail one or more classes. Um, once again, rarely has that been based on their learning ability, based on systems, based on um, kind of storm and stress developmentally, but um, you know, having almost 40% of students fail a class in ninth grade obviously sets things off to a bad path. Um, Low graduation rates, um, Rob often speaks, but your graduation rate is often really predicated on how the ninth grade. So if students earn their credits in ninth grade, the likelihood of their graduation and in four years is very high. If they don't earn those credits in ninth grade, not only do they have to make those credits up, they've got to be taking those 10th grade classes at the same time. So those are some of the, you know, the early signs and the kind of easy predictors in terms of students who will not be graduating is ninth graders who do not pass all their classes. National average is um, a quarter of ninth graders have to take the entire ninth grade over. They start all over um, on a national piece. And um, some schools, once again, have over 45%. So um, the overall model can be used in grades 6 through 10th. Some middle schools are looking at adopting this model. Um, but we've really focused on ninth grade. That's what our focus has been. So the motivation, so this was me, and this was Mr. Laney, in terms of those who have been here for you know, quite some time. So I was the ninth grade counselor, and it was my fifth year in 1998. And we had over half the ninth graders failing a class. And so my job was just ridiculous. So I would call Bruce in and say, Bruce, you know, you're failing math. And he'd say, Ms. Jerbeck, it's OK. Everyone's failing math. Don't be worried about it. Um, which was really what had happened. The social norms had really gotten skewed. There wasn't a stigma with not passing. And so what happened also was a number of the ninth grade teachers would try to get out of ninth grade as soon as possible. So not only are you working with ninth graders, you're not feeling real successful with your career when in fact the students aren't being successful. So I went to Mr. Laney and said, I just you know, don't feel like this is is really working. And we were having a pretty significant dip in student attendance at that point, too. Our ninth grade class was really shrinking. And I um, actually spoke to um, Rabbi Herring at the time. He came and said, I'm a little concerned before his son was coming in and was concerned about you know, what's going on. Because the other at-risk behaviors were skyrocketing, too. So our ninth graders, based on Minnesota student survey, were skipping. And they're you know, doing other risky things because they weren't engaged in school. So um, 
Bob was very empowering and did say, well, I really don't have another system and we really don't have any other money, but if you have something else, come back to me. So I took that as a challenge and spent the entire summer going through lots of research, reworked, came up with a brand new system, said, here's what we do ninth grade. And he's like, well, okay, that's great. How are you going to come up with the money? So then I wrote my first big grant. And so I wrote a state incentive grant and came back four months later and said, we've got the money. I've got a new blueprint. I think we should, you know, give this a try. And, and I really appreciate that he was willing to, to, to let this, you know, kind of go. So that's how things really started was the fact that um, I, we had a kind of administrator willing to take a risk and we were really kind of able to kind of move forward. So that's how that began. Um, so as I referenced, you know, we were right between 44 and 47 percent of our ninth graders were failing a class. And that was our fifth year that we'd had that. So the philosophy was going to be, this is the whole class. I've now, you know, we've deemed all of ninth grade is a risk. You know, simply coming into a big high school, everything else that's, that's hitting, that we're going to focus on the whole class. Because we had, prior to that, often looked for subgroups. Students were going to really watch closely, and we'd watch them, and then a whole other group would fall apart while we were watching this other group. So we're like, everybody, regardless of your academic placement, you're all in this new model. So, you know, all honors, everything, you're in this new model. It's also strength-based. So we were saying, this is going to leverage strengths. We're not going to be remedying problems. Um, and then we had strategies for teachers, staff, students, and parents. So that was kind of the overall coaching goal. This is a, a, a small logic model, which I will not discuss at length, but another time. But in general, you can see that you know we kind of now have three frameworks. So developmental assets, that's our big undergirding one. We still use the risk and resiliency, and we also use the attribution theory in terms of student motivation, in terms of kind of what we're trying to have happen. Then we have four school level strategies, four student level strategies, and then we have four outcomes. These would be the framework pieces. I think the one I would draw the most attention to, and one of the newest ones on the scene, is the attribution theory of student motivation. So really what we're trying to do is increase students' motivation, to have them really kind of take an active role in engaging, that we provide a community and a context, but have the student be the one engaging. OK, um, I'm Justin Barbeau. And in addition to um, spearheading the expansion here of the BAR program into uh, 10th through 12th grade, I'm also um, the director of technical ed for the other sites. So I travel quarterly to their schools to help them move to fidelity to the logic model. So a lot of these outcomes and all of the um, fidelity pieces that we're going to kind of discuss in the evaluation um, is now becoming uh, ingrained in what they do at their site. So it's really exciting to see what they're doing. I also bring a staff member who's been a part of the program so they can come back and as well improve our workings here. So it really has become kind of a workforce development model. So we're really excited about that. Um, the outcomes that we're seeing here at all of the sites in, in uh, increasing student achievement scores, which is obviously absolutely essential. Uh, we see that for across the board, which is quite unique for a, uh, a model to actually achieve. Uh, we identify students who can both be accelerated and obviously remediated. And the middle student is not being left behind in this model, which is uh, really unique. Uh, when you're able to uh, successfully get students passing at a rate that we've been able to, and we'll show you here um, soon, you're able to really manage. Um, you're really able to manage and provide ex uh, off or op opportunities, acceleration opportunities, um, additional elective coursework, a lot of other pieces, because you're not having to remediate coursework in English, science, social studies, and math. You're not having to run additional sections to make up. So this has been a piece that we've kind of brought, uh, pulled the curtain back on a lot of these um, data pieces for the schools that we're working with, and they're really excited to see that as well. Uh, we are currently working. We've done a, a variety of independent evaluation trials. Right now, we're obviously doing a randomized control trial uh, in California, and we have the results that we'll show you um, of that, which is half of the ninth grade got the program, half didn't. So it is um, meets the threshold of the What Works Clearinghouse. Uh, you can see our failure rates. We've been able to successfully bring them down here. The students are achieving down to an 11% rate, with national average still hovering around 35% uh, for the majority of schools. And we've been able to keep that down um, with an increase in free and reduced lunch up to 34% this year. Um, so we're really happy to see that number stay there. 87% um, uh, of our students are passing all their core subjects, which is a direct correlate to graduation rate. If you can do that, you're going to be able to not only offer acceleration for students, prep for college, but also be able to um, continue to have everybody uh, achieving at a similar rate. 
and we've seen an acceleration of our students of color in honors coursework. Um, eight students up to uh, actually over, over 100 now, uh, and number of credits earned last year was up to 230 in AP and IB coursework. Um, Leanne Stevens is here and she's been spearheading that effort and doing a wonderful job. Um, the percentages are consistent with our population and uh, we're working with Leanne and Leanne's doing a wonderful job of helping support them as they make that transition into uh, some more advanced coursework. This was our uh, failure rate 1998 baseline when uh, Angie was talking uh, that she, she noticed that the majority of students were failing. 44 percent um, down to 11. You can see 44 percent of our students had one or more Fs. 18 percent had uh, two plus. Uh, and you can see we brought that number down um, considerably. Uh, and one of, the, one of the really interesting pieces that you'll see here, those little blips that go up, um, this program, this model, has been um, incredibly successful at seeing this data in real time and being able to adjust. Each one of those dots is a semester. So you can see if you have a, a blip up, we were able to adjust and uh, correct um, quickly, which is, um, which is really a powerful uh, piece that most schools aren't able to keep their fingers on. Additionally, not only remediating, but also accelerating. Um, you're not going to be able to offer as many AP and IB and multiple languages um, and as music and all the other pieces you want to offer if your students aren't passing at a, at a healthy clip. And thank goodness we've increased that number. And over the same time, tenure of the program, you can see um, our AP and IB tests taken have gone up uh, almost in, in lockstep. Uh, this would be about 508 students. Um, taking over 1,220 exams, which is pretty impressive. Um, so we're really happy to see that this is not simply a remediation model, but also an acceleration model. Sure. So that's some St. Louis Park pieces. And what I want to be clear about what the bar model does is it really um, empowers the staff to say, identify students who should be in accelerated coursework. So we have you know three adults that are looking for students who probably wouldn't sign up naturally, and then be kind of we have a full court press because they're with them for a year. So by the time you know the end of the year, we are able to get them to the point to take that risk, and then once again have programs in place like Leanne has that she can then support them and can carry them through. But having basically your entire workforce looking for this you know kind of untapped potential is one of the ways that we've been able to move things forward. Um, the I3 grant has given us the luxury and or stress of being able to do a randomized control trial, um, which has been just kind of fascinating in an educational setting. So um, what was done is they had, you know, 555 students initially, and they were willing. They sent away their entire roster of students to um, APT associates in Cambridge, Massachusetts, who randomly assigned the students either to the way the high school had been run or the new bar model. And then the students came back, and they, this is how we were able to be able to assess the effectiveness, because one of the issues with education is to find a comparative group. So they literally could say, you're in the same school, teachers are randomly assigned, students are randomly assigned, let's see how this model plays out. So just the only real notable thing is, too, as you can see, about a third of the students are Hispanic. So we also were able to look at some achievement gap just because we had such a large number of students of color. The top line is really the, kind of the critical piece. The study group is actually the implementation group. So what this um, chart does is basically say that they looked at the students' reading, math, gender, and ethnicity to make sure they were equivalent prior to saying you know, the bar implementation was the difference. So that's what the bottom thing is. And at the very you know, last, the point 0.008 means that they ended up being highly statistically different in terms of the number of courses that were earned, in terms of um, that was one of the main findings. Um, the other piece is the achievement scores. So both with language and math, and they did pre-post NWA scores, the, the Let's see here, the comparison group is blue and intervention group is green. So the students who were in the bar model um, signif significantly grew in their achievement scores. So not only do they earn more credits, but you'd like to believe credits also equal achievement. It did. So the students also showed a higher growth in their achievement scores in terms of um, both math and language. And then educational disparities. So in both the study groups, the Hispanic students earned slightly fewer cl class fewer credits than did non-Hispanic, but in the um, bar model, they earned more credits and they were earning at a faster rate. So on this next slide, you'll also be able to see the map scores. So all the green um, 
line is once again the um, non-Hispanic, but you can see that the trajectory of the blue one is growing at a faster rate. So that is, you know, just to be very honest, what's really put us in the national landscape. So to have a, a model that is kind of a social emotional model, a model that's changing the climate, be moving achievement scores, really hasn't been shown to be done before. So that's really what has kind of caught a lot of people's attention. We have more outcomes than we have goals, which is nice to have. So we, um, based on you know, a variety of surveys, as well as findings in the Minnesota Student Survey, you know, we've been able to show um, a number of kind of um, overall climate pieces, as well as kind of decreased risk pieces. So that's some other outcomes we have. And then teacher effectiveness. So a little glitch that happened this summer when the I-3 grant got announced, the category that we'd applied to in the past was underperforming schools. They didn't have that category this summer. I'm like, well, that's interesting. So now we're going to apply, and the category that we were advised to apply for was teacher effectiveness. So um, the definition of a highly effective teacher means a teacher whose students achieve high rates, example, one and a half grade levels in one academic year of, um, based on achievement scores. So then we had to go back into the randomized control trial recalculate things, and we were able to find out the students who were in the bar model achieved an average of two years of growth compared to those who are in the um, traditional model. So we were able to say that these teacher teams actually um, increased teacher effectiveness. So that was how we um, had to, you know, be, we were able to meet that definition. I'm going to hit just the highlights of this, and then I'll just and I'll kind of drill down a little bit on some of the key components. But um, kind of what is it is um, two days of professional development before school starts, really focusing on kind of a whole a whole student, you know, really looking at multiple perspectives. The other piece is restructuring the course schedule. That was the one that, in particular, Mr. Laney was like, "We're going to do what?" I'm like, "Yeah, the master schedule's got to go. We can't, you know, can't do it the way we've been doing this here." And that would mean that you need to have a common group of students that is shared by a group of teachers. The class sizes vary a lot with our I3 sites. The average class size in California is about 45, 46 is what they're averaging. In Maine, tends to be 12 to 13. So, um, and similar performance. <laughs> I think is one of the things that's really fascinating. So the key piece is that you have a common group of students that are shared by three adults, and that those three adults have a set meeting time that they can be discussing those students. And the I'll have Justin go through it in more detail, but the meeting is very, um, we use the best meeting practices. Um, one of the pieces that one of our evaluators talk about, my um, father worked in business for forever in quality control. And you will see many business aspects in terms of this um, program, in terms of how um, teachers can work effectively together and really looking at, you know, trying to have the student have a, a very positive experience. Contextual support is focused on leadership. And then there are a number of parent components, which we can discuss at another time. The student level strategies is both the whole student emphasis. Um, there's a curriculum that um, I had developed ahead of time that the classroom teachers do with the students 30 minutes a week. And it really, the primary focus is building this relationship, this intentional relationship. We are covering topics that are, I think are necessary for young adults or adults to have, but it really is a mechanism to um, be forming this relationship. Seven and eight are just key, and seven and eight are data-driven and really intentional, where these are these team meetings, it's collaborative problem solving, and um, based on students' performance in um, strategy seven, um, strategy eight is risk review, and risk review is our notable interface with the community resources. So that's where the students, we get resources in place that the school is just not equipped to deal with and get those um, resources in place there. But both of those are using data all in a um, very regular basis. Yep. So one of the key pieces uh, that differentiates us from um, everybody else that's done some sort of an RTI intervention model is that we really built it off of uh, an acuity scale um, like the medical model follows. Uh, we looked at uh, these block meetings as being the most critical part of what happens here where you have three shared professionals, one may be a new teacher, one may be um, 
a very veteran teacher, and they're sharing ideas and strategies about the student. There's been a lot of meetings around students that um, kind of stay at the level of academics, which is critical, and you get there. Um, but the initial piece is looking at some of those non-academic barriers to success and identifying school-related factors that you can impact. Um, and with having three adults, like you do in a business world for quality control, um, these people are able to see a student over three hours and share the behaviors that they're seeing and problem solve and identify strategies that will um, that will work. And they're leveraging real-time data every week with our SIS, our uh, student information system, PowerSchool. Um, we're also working with schools that have the other two major systems as well. And the process is the exact same at every school. It's amazing to see that um, the challenges that each of these schools face. Um, the students are the exact same in every location we go to. Um, when we uh, when, when I came up with this leveling system, I had identified um, that when we'd come into these team meetings, um, our, we have our social worker, our counselor come in, our dean come in, we have a large team meeting who show up once a week to each one of these teams of teachers. We have, for example, five ninth grade teams right now. And they rotate during the week and they come in and give feedback of what's happening on risk review and different pieces um, about strategies that they could use based on the more information that they have. And we found that uh, we needed to find a way, just like the medical model, that you'd be able to identify ahead of time based on factors like a doctor would. Um, we're looking at attendance, absences, behavior, and then of course just professional judgment. The subjectivity of that piece and the, uh, the wealth of experience that is shared in that room. I remember my first year here 10 years ago, I'm sitting with a, uh, Joe Getty and a few teachers that really had a lot of experience um, and were able to kind of pinpoint and, and, and very efficiently identify needs that were there uh, and they were accurate. So we looked at this. Um, I'm going to give you actually our breakdown of our student body last year based on need. Um, we had uh, about 45 percent of our students would be considered thriving students um, according to our category. They would occasionally need a little bit of help but they were able to kind of get back on track um, both academically and with um, uh, behavior on their own. Uh, we had another 35% of our ninth graders who needed a little bit of help. They were socio-emotionally typical of the students um, and they were, uh, they would usually get back on their own. Uh, that's the majority of our students as you can see. They'd get back in, that's 80% are covered there. And then there was another group that based on those brief interventions that our teacher teams would do um, and individual teachers would do, they needed a little bit more. Um, they needed the team to strategize. They needed to meet with the counselor, um, potentially with the social worker, uh, and, and, and get a professional opinion on some potential other uh, barriers that may be in place. Uh, and so from that meeting, the teacher or the social worker, the counselor would determine whether or not we should refer through into risk review. Um, which we can show you here, or whether we should kick it back to the team and say monitor for another week or two and look for grades, behavior changes, all those different pieces. Um, the goal is obviously to support every single student and not simply remediation, but also acceleration. And then of course level three is the, um, the highest need um, students, many of which have um, a, uh, many, many uh, challenges. Um, we, uh, we here for this 5%, we spend, most schools will spend their entire year on these 5%. And we said, we need to get resources in place once we identify who these 5% five, uh, 5 are. Uh, and we need to get our community resources in place, do everything we can, but then we need to quickly flip the model to make sure those coughs at the level two and the level one don't turn into pneumonia. And that's a model that totally flipped from what most public schools do. Um, they usually spend all of their time and resource on that bottom 5%. Your failure rate goes from 20% up to 40 before you know it. That social norming that Angie talked about happens. So um, we run these failure lists. We look at the students who are getting C's and honors coursework. We look at um, a variety of different pieces that are touchstones, and then we feed those back. Uh, and this helps us align our student services and our resources at our our school because we don't have uh, unlimited pots of money. So we're able to really nail down on who these students are and what they, uh, what they most need. Um, here is the pie chart. You can see we had 160 of those students that were level zero. Uh, when we go down to a level, th uh, level three risk review, these students, there were 25 of them that were really uh, extraordinarily high needs. Uh, all of them had multiple Fs in coursework. Um, we were able to get, uh, and we have resources in place now within risk review, a process that's set up uh, similarly that is able to show whether or not our resources that we have at our school are actually moving the dial to get these students re-engaged um, or whether or not we need to go and look for another. And there are 63 that flowed through this process and back out. So we really get to know the students um, exceptionally well in this process and it helps streamline all of your support services within your school. 
school uh, to efficiently meet the needs of staff and students. So kind of the last thing is, so as you heard, we were in Maine. Um, we had about 100 people that were in attendance in Maine. All the superintendents and principals came from all the schools. Um, the Acting Commissioner of Education of Maine um, was in attendance. Um, the mayor, I mean, we, we really had, you know, um, kind of the, the kind of the, the full um, kind of contingency. And it is really interesting to see where the schools have come from the past three years and kind of where we're at now. And it is, once again, I think important that, that St. Louis Park people be aware that this is something that really is looking at now kind of a national model. So I think with that, we'll, you know, kind of, if there's any questions or any pieces. It is just so impressive. It's such amazing, good, innovative work, and, and we've stayed the course, and you've made the corrections, and I'm just so proud of everything that, that everyone has done to make this work well for us. I, early on, Angie, I'm assuming that the stats you were showing us were sort of national stats or stats when we began the program, right? That is correct. Because our current graduation rate is about 80 percent and amongst, among the highest, really. Absolutely. Yeah, it's so those are national national data points and kind of once again um, why ninth grade is such a critical piece yeah I'm curious um, when you have those 30 minute time settings with teachers to build relationships that you mm -hmm. talked about mm -hmm. what kinds of topics do you oh, uh, sure. do you include in that yes so there's a curriculum I'd be happy to show you but like the initial ones I mean um, communication um, would be an early one, and it's verbal and nonverbal. Nonverbal communication is very important to teach to ninth graders because even if you say yes and roll your eyes, that's a really different message. Um, we discuss grief and loss because there's a lot of grief and loss in high school because you try out for a team or you you know have a relationship that doesn't work out. Um, we talk about risky behaviors, so um, talk about dreams, talk about goal setting, talk about stress management. So there's kind of the, the big categories. And one of the big pieces is that um, one of our early findings is the um, evaluator said that it humanized the teacher because the teacher participates also. So like there's an activity like what's on your plate? And you know you write down all the things that you have to, to do in your life and what you find joy in and what you don't. But the student scene that a teacher has a plate too, you know, and so this is happening 30 minutes, you know, a week. When I say 30 minutes a week, if you have a team of three teachers, each teacher only does it every three weeks. So it's not like, you know, so the student has it every 30, every 30 minutes a week, but the teacher doesn't because it comes out of their classroom instruction time. So they rotate that, but those are kind of some of the, the big topics. Mm -hmm. Now, as I understood the I-3 grant, one of the benefits of St. Louis Park, other than being able to export kind of our idea, was also to expand it here within the high school to get it 9 through 12. I think you touched on it. Mm -hmm. What have we learned about our experience in trying to export upward, I guess, here at St. Louis Park? And, and mm -hmm. I know that some of that worked with kind of altering our high school, too, and this is kind of the... I guess it's the first year when they're in the academies and stuff. I know it's hinged together. Right. So I'll hit some of it, and I can have Justin talk about it too. And I will be honest, we did not put um, a lot of that information into the next application because um, we didn't, we weren't able to study anything. As well as I didn't want to rule us out in terms of more funding, in terms of you know that we've been able to say this is what works and doesn't what you know isn't what works. Um, what we have been able to do is do a tenth grade hybrid of all the teams. So our tenth grades are not in tight teams, but they are in loose teams now and they're meeting before school which is what the schedule adjustment is they've all been trained in this system so once again now we have ninth and tenth grade teachers all talking with leveling students the same way which also really helps with popcorning of names so oftentimes you get hey jim needs some help and joe needs some help well jim may need help with you know homelessness and joe needs help with assignments so having that leveled you know, idea in terms of what the needs are really helps continuity of services, you know, kind of getting into place quickly. So we know how, you know, if, if, you know, someone says, you know, I think Jim's a level three student, basically, you know, triage. I mean, something is really, you know, kind of very serious. So we were able to put the 10th grade system in place starting last year. Um, we once again are building out the academy you know, pieces really having college and career be the overt thing. But if funding comes in place, then we would have four more years to really um, we would have two years to build it solidly in conjunction with the other schools and then two years to have it be tested someplace else while we keep implementing is the way the, the grant is written. Do you have any other? Sure. Um, so the luxury of this grant was that it was expand and then try some things here. The other exciting piece is that this model, all of this training of this piece here has been done and so 9th through 12th grade everybody has an advisor and on Tuesday and Thursday mornings those advisors 
are monitoring their grades based on this and then entering the data of concerns or areas and connecting with parents and because we've heard about communication needing to increase as well in grades 10 through 12 uh, because they felt a drop off historically after the ninth grade model. So now we have every student has a point person um, who's not only providing them the college and career uh, information six times a year. Um, but is also uh, monitoring their grades and then meeting with them. They have these students in their first hour every day. So they're able to intervene quickly. Uh, and so we've streamlined that up uh, as well. So we're pretty excited to see how that's taking forth. And uh, the academy piece we just presented to um, uh, our Academy Leach is presented to the Governor's Workforce um, Council because they're really excited to learn more about how we're doing this work. Um, it was a piece that they're starting to now catch up and kind of see what high schools potentially can do to help grease the wheels moving into uh, freshman year of college and how we can work with those uh, two-year schools. We're working closely with uh, a couple of them around here right now. So, uh, I had a question, Angie, and maybe you're the one, that perhaps you both can. Uh, we have a mission for this mm -hmm. district. Mm -hmm. How does this impact our mission? Can mm -hmm. you speak to that a bit? Well, I, I don't know if I can recite the mission, but I know it pretty well, at least in kind of, you know, but it really in terms of all students being successful, you know, that's, you know, and really kind of looking at the whole student. I mean, this literally, there is no way any student is being missed, ever. You know, so in terms of the high school, where once again, that traditionally has been, you know, the biggest miss nationally, you have three teachers that are logging grades every week and discussing the students, including our thriving students. So I think all students really maximizing their potential aligns I feel really well with what St. Louis Park stands for. I, I really do appreciate that because when we wrote that mission and said all students or wrote the objectives against it, mm -hmm. all students will. Mm -hmm. This is powerful. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to when Peter Benson was here mm -hmm. and did that first longitudinal study yeah. and we saw people going in directions that we were not happy with. Mm -hmm. It's incredible mm -hmm. what you have done. And, and what this district has done. And now to be exporting it, I'm, I'm with Nancy. I'm just, I'm ecstatic about what you're doing and how, how great it, and, and the recognition is, is fine, sure. but it is what you're doing for this district that I really love. You, you said something earlier about getting, and, and you gave the, showed the chart with the increase in the number of students taking uh, IB and AP classes. Mm -hmm. Uh, could you speak to that a little bit? Because you, the way you said it, and Leanne is, you know, I, I know she's working the problem all the time, but having our students of color in those classes when before, mm -hmm. those students couldn't even get into those classes. Right. That, we, we created mm -hmm. illogical barriers, mm -hmm. and now you're, can you talk about how you're taking them down? Absolutely. Although I do want to comment first. I did, Peter Benson is just such a mentor and a friend of mine, you know, and I just have to say it's very exciting to nationally be having his work go forward again. So I did want to just say that that's something that's been, in particular, the past couple weeks. Um, it, was, it happened to be Peter Benson's anniversary of his death when we were in Maine, which someone had, you know, brought up and once again had said that he just, you know, in terms of Peter Benson's where he started the work and now the fact that it literally can be transforming the way schools work is, is a pretty exciting place to be. But in terms of the AP and IB, so a, a couple things. A, yes, there were barriers in place, but there are also notably social barriers and students unwilling to take risks and teachers maybe not seeing the needs of supports to be able to get students into those classes. So we really ask our ninth grade teachers to look at their students, and students in particular we often say that are getting Bs and really not breaking a sweat, you know what, they should probably be in an advanced level course. And so they, we have three teachers that are quite frankly really working with those students, starts in about December, and they will actually um, do some honors assignments with them in ninth grade. So even if they're not in the honors team, we now have honors work that is being done in ninth grade to be able to show the student, you can do this work, it's supported, and you have these three adults that are saying, you can do this. And we have a big influx of students, and Rob, you're gonna help me with the numbers, almost double the numbers of students signing up for honors coursework in 10th grade compared to ninth grade. And a lot of that's based on the fact that, you know, we have all these adults saying, you can do it, you can do it, and then we have, you know, Leanne and her systems to support them after they're, you know, kind of in the in the class. But I think the fact that you have a notable and a system to be able to do that, so versus just saying, look for students, I mean, it's like, you know, we'll send the mass email to say, all teams, 
This week, look at your data not for failure rates, look at students that should be accelerated, and then get strategies in place. So we can really strongly message that to students who maybe aren't getting that message at home, maybe didn't feel like that was something comfortable for them to do to get them in the class. I just have a follow-up, and I know that we've kind of gone upwards with your program, but have you thought about going down? I mean, risky your behavior starting earlier, getting kids at sixth grade now that we have at the middle school. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of that encouragement to push happens there. So by ninth grade, they've already been told by someone, hey, you got some talent. You, you, know, you have some skills. You need to be pushed. I'd like to see it. At least I'm thinking, I don't know what your thoughts are, but about driving that down. Nationally, it's been asked to, and actually I've been asked to adapt, I'm actually in the process of adapting everything. It's an adult model, so it really doesn't have implications as much on the students, with the exception of for the eye time, but to make sure that they're appropriate you know, for younger students. But the model is an adult model. So subsequently, the way you work, um, we have these fidelity sheets that you go through that, you know, as um, Justin referenced, when you go out and you, are they collaborative problem solving, are they setting goals, that, you know, that type of system, you know, I, I would agree, kind of works at regardless of your age level of students. I wanted to just add, Nancy had a great question about graduation rates. I know our latest data shows that our current graduation rate is 85%. And the graduation rate for black students is 80%. Mm -hmm. And as you look across uh, school districts of Minnesota and across the nation, it is extremely rare that the graduation rate really has very little if no achievement gap. Mm -hmm. And that's an unbelievable accomplishment here in St. Louis Park. When I looked at the numbers of ninth graders who failed a class last year, 11% of ninth graders failed one class or more. So we can predict four years from now pretty closely that 89% will graduate in four years. Mm -hmm. Because if you pass all your ninth grade classes, the chances you're gonna graduate in four years is extremely high. Mm -hmm. Last uh, Friday, I was at a meeting with all the superintendents from Hennepin County and the county commissioners and the commissioner of education. Topic was graduation rate because the graduation rate in Hennepin County is not that great. And the school districts in Hennepin County are really working hard to turn that around. And I had a little bit of time to talk with the superintendents and the commissioners about this program and how effectively it's increased graduation rates here. So I'm hoping that the news will get out in our local area and that we'll be able to uh, be a force for good in Hennepin County with this model that, that definitely will increase graduation rates. I just want to add one more thing. Um, on your chart, I really like it. Uh, the thing that I notice about it, though, is there's a step function in about uh, 2006 and uh, between 2006 and 2008. That is the time when Mr. Metz took over as the principal <laughs> of the high school. Uh, and, and the reason I raise this is w when we wanted someone who knew what they were doing with the numbers, who knew what they were doing with this program. We, we certainly didn't want to go backwards. And when we hired our new superintendent, uh, a lot of people came in and could wave their arms and talk about what they might do uh, when they came into a district like St. Louis Park. Uh, Rob Metz could stand up there and say, this is what we did. And to have the highest graduation rate, uh, the this step function, and again, Leanne, I, Leanne Stevens is here. I do want to recognize her because she's doing great things for our students. And uh, that step function is you, it's Leanne, it's Mr. Metz, and uh, we're awfully proud of that in this district. So thank you for all that all of you are doing. Thank you. That's a delightful way to start the evening. Uh, <clears throat> now we have uh, some other fun topics. Uh, the, the referendum update, uh, Sandy. Or, oh, I'm sorry, Rob. You. Uh, I'm pleased to give a quick referendum update uh, for those watching at home and in attendance here tonight. First of all, just, remind, just a reminder that there's an important election on November 5th, Tuesday, November 5th, just three weeks away. There are going to be three questions on the ballot. The first question has to do with our current technology levy. Uh, that levy is going to be running out in one more year. So question one would 
uh, revoke the final year of our current technology levy and then increase it for 10 more years at a rate of $1.75 million each year. Uh, the goal of that first question is to get technology, the most up-to-date technology, into the hands of our teachers and students. The second question has to do with buildings. It's called a bond for buildings question. It would provide $14.9 million over the next nine years, and it would do really two things. Uh, first, it would help us keep up on the regular maintenance that's required at all of our buildings. And secondly, it would uh, create some additions onto Peter Hobart, Susan Lindgren, and Aquila, three classrooms onto each school. That would help us relieve some of our overcrowding and also help us make room for all day kindergarten. And the third question we're calling Levy for Learning. This is the only question that can be used to add to our uh, add teachers and maintain programming that we currently have. It's $1.1 million over 10 years. So all three questions will appear on the ballot on November 5th. If all three questions passed, I, Jim? I think 1.1 million each year for 10 years, not over 10 years, right? Thank you, Jim. Yes, the third question, the levy question is $1.1 million each year for 10 years. If all three questions passed uh, on a $200,000 home in St. Louis Park, the average increase would be $6.83 a month, or about $82 a year. This past Saturday, I saw many of you at our district technology showcase, which was a time for teachers from across the district to come together at Aquila School and demonstrate the most up-to-date technology that's being used in the St. Louis Park classrooms. It was awesome. It was wonderful. Uh, we saw high school teachers that were showing off the robot from the robotics team and 3D printing capabilities, flipped classrooms, uh, our IB film class was demonstrating some of the film projects that they'd created. Uh, elementary students were demonstrating smart board technology. It was just terrific. Uh, that was videotaped and should be appearing on our local cable access channel soon. I continue to go out and about uh, doing referendum presentations. This week I did the high school PTO right before this meeting. And on Wednesday I have three. I'm going to Lenox at 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to uh, Meadowbrook after school, and then I'll be at the St. Louis Park Schools Foundation in the evening. So I'm getting as many places as I can, sharing all kinds of referendum information. Uh, and then uh, that might be it. I just wanted to just bring people up to date that the referendum is drawing near, and we're getting out sharing as much information as, as we can. Thank you, Rob. Any questions? Okay, Sandy, now we're ready for the Sandy Salen Show. Uh, Sandy has uh, two subjects she'll talk about. One is the Peter Hobart construction update, and then she will, after she's done with that, uh, she will then talk about the general obligation school building refunding bonds. And it'll be just one moment as I get plugged in here. Okay. While we have a couple of minutes, any comments for those of us who were at the uh, technology fair? What did you think? Um, I think Rob was accurate when he said awesome. And so I'll, I'll uh, ditto that. But, I mean, one thing I did want to say is, you know, there was a lot of... Um, neat stuff, neat technology that we use, but each person who was demonstrating it was able to show, wow, this is really neat stuff, but we're, all, we're able to use it for this application. We're able to improve the learning because, because of this. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to say is that, you know, that 3D printer is really interesting it's really neat you know they made like little octopus shapes and things out of it but i'll say you know for my job as a medical device engineer we use a 3d printer at work we get images back from uh, patients and we're able to create the path using a 3d printer so you know they're using things and and um, that 
you know, I didn't use until maybe a couple years ago. So it's really great to see this stuff getting, you know, driven down to, you know, lower and lower grades, and these kids are learning so many new things. Uh, so it was really neat to see. Yes, I am. Sandy is ready. Thank you. Yep. Um, we're going to do the Peter Hobart project update, but before I go on to where we're at today with it, I want to go through real quickly with, um, um, a, I guess, a reiteration of what happened before we got to this point. Um, and I'm going to go through it real quickly because I know we've seen this presentation before, but for those that haven't, um, we had a elementary task force um, that worked on the, this project of identifying um, the space issues in the elementary schools. And this elementary task force consisted of principals, teachers, um, um, world architects, as, as well as administration and community members to determine um, what our space issues are and what to do about those space issues and as a part of that recommendation was brought to the superintendent on April 22nd of this last year um, or this current year and the board approved um, two classrooms at Peter Hobart to be funded from a lease purchase agreement or the lease levy on, on that same board meeting to go forth with that project. Um, a lot of construction requirements um, happen in these kind of projects. Um, a consultation letter had to be um, sent to the Minnesota Department of Education, which was sent on April 23rd, shortly after the approval process. And the approval um, happened quite quickly um, for the consultation from MD on April 29th. Um, Wold Architect was in the process um, throughout the, the May and um, the rest of the month to finalize plans and budgets. Um, Ehlers, um, our, who was our district financial advisors, um, was in the process during the month of May in so soliciting bids from financial institutions for the lease purchase funding. And uh, during this time, our district attorney was finalizing the lease purchase agreement. So there was a lot of things going on at the same time in order to get this paperwork done and the finalization of the funding. Um, a lot of requirements still exist. Um, the board um, was able to approve the lease purchase agreement by June 24th. Um, lease purchase financing closing did not occur until July 24th. It took um, that long of a process for that to happen. Um, also, we are required by state statute to bid for construction projects such as, the, such as this project, and we are required to uh, put um, two advertisements advertisements in the local paper, um, which we did during the first two weeks of August. So the whole summer really contributed to getting things ready for the construction and getting our contractor in place. Um, the construction contractor bid was awarded on August 16th. Um, in the meantime, we were, and right after that, um, the conditional use permit was approved by the City Council on August 19th, because this was kind of in the process in the meantime, too, throughout the summer, and getting that approved. Um, contractor was securing subcontractors and planning the work and doing all the final stages of what they need to do to get the construction plan in place. Um, and during that time, the last time that we had talked, we were uh, finalizing um, plan review with the city and Wold con Architects, um, but that has since um, been done, but it did take a while, and I will show you a schedule to show kind of how that took place. Um, and then we had a pre-construction meeting on September 11th, which consisted of uh, the contractors, Wold Architects, and the district staff. And according to contract, the construction completion date was December 21st. And I know this is going to be hard to see, but hopefully you have a better copy there. I was expecting it to uh, look a little bit better on the screen. but. We have, this is the construction schedule as of October 9th. And 
there was a lot of things going on um, um, throughout the summer, like I just presented to get to this point, um, but building permits um, took a while um, to get from the city. There was a process that had to take place and a lot of review that had to take place and they were kind of backlogged with a lot of building permits that they were dealing with. Um, so it took a while to get those building permits finalized, which didn't take until September 23rd. Um, so really the contractors were Tied, hands were kind of tied before they couldn't even start the project until they got those building permits. Um, in the meantime, they were still working on stuff. They were still doing their shop drawings and, um, and finalizing those um, drawings in order to uh, start the project. Um, and when they got the, um, and, and, and during this time also, they were doing some demo work. Um, there was a lot of demolition, or not a lot of, but some demolition that needed to occur um, in the current um, structure that is um, that they need to tie into in order to make it work. They had to uh, dem do a demolition of a staircase as well as some tile work, and I know this created a lot of noise, um, and Shelly has been working very very um, closely with the contractors to make this work, um, but yet keep the operations going on in the school um, to have as least amount of noise as possible for the students. Um, and right, the biggest um, noise that occurred was due to the staircase, because they do have to use jackhammers, and, and it really created a lot of noise. Um, but that has been completed, and they have a little bit of tile to, to remove and a little bit more um, um, demolition, but that should be completed within the next three days. But Shelly's working on moving kids to different areas so it doesn't um, upset their day during this construction. Um, right now what you will see is footings are being put in at um, Peter Hobart. There was a little bit of a setback um, with the putting of the footings also because they found out that there was more water than they expected to be. So they had to go through a process of getting the water out of the um, um, grading in order to, to make the footings work and have since um, solved that problem but are working on um, getting that um, resolved so they can put the footings in properly. Properly. So there was a few setbacks right from the start. Um, you will, um, you do have a copy of uh, the progress that is expected to take place and construction projects are what they are and we always expect that things um, can come into play to make things different. But um, when we come up to the end of the um, finish date, um, we are going to be extending it to January 13th um, rather than the December date that um, was according to their contract. There was too many um, setbacks right from the beginning that were out of their control um, that we can't um, hold them accountable for. So we are going to be pushing that date to January 13th and um, continue on with this project and hope everything else goes well. Any questions? So what does that mean for the use of that space heading into early 2014? And additionally, the other question is, it seems like we're pretty aggressive to even get to that. Uh, what are, are, are there ways to make up time well, you on know, we're, we're hoping. You know, like I say, you know, the construction project is going to continue on as is. Um, we hope that maybe we can buy some time by, you know, things going better than what they anticipate are is going to happen during this construction process but this is their best estimate at this point in time as far as their planning process goes um, you know if we do better in some areas we can hopefully buy some time to even make it a better situation um, but at this point we don't anticipate that we won't be done any sooner than january 13th And uh, Shelley is aware of this, um, and, and Peter Hobart's staff is aware of this, as well as the, the uh, parents. So um, they have been um, informed that this is the process and this is the estimated end time. Other questions? Yeah. Nancy? So if that go, so if this, if the January 13th time is met, then looking at the calendar, it looks like our kids are back for one week after spring break. Um, do you know, are they planning to move classrooms in there over or, or that break, I have, or how yeah. are they going to, Yeah, we don't know enough to co how that's going to coordinate yet, but we no. can. No, yeah. You know, I, th I think Shelly probably would be able to answer that question better since she's kind of taking care of that process of planning that out. Um, but, you know, at this point, 
I don't know what their plans are in moving in. It would be awfully nice if they finished on a Friday as opposed to a Monday. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Sandy. Ready? Next subject. Yes. We have Gary from Allers, um, who will be presenting um, the resolution that is going to be brought before the board um, for the refunding. And he also has a little bit of uh, news for us from Moody's. And then with that, I'll introduce Gary. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, before we get into the refunding, uh, just a, a discussion. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the good news we got today from Moody's. Um, Moody's Investor Service announced that they'll be upgrading the district's underlying bond rating from an AA3 to a AA2. The upgrade will apply not only to these refunding bonds, but uh, all the other bonds that are outstanding. And in addition to that, any future bonds you would issue, including those that you might pass after the November election. So, and of course, what, what that means is a higher bond rating means lower interest rates. So that's, that's the benefit of having that, that upgrade. Um, that puts you in kind of an elite category. There are only 11 districts in the state that have a higher rating than you do. There are three districts that have a triple A rating and uh, eight districts that are a double A one. And then there's 16 districts in your category and everybody else is below that. So it puts you in, in, in pretty good company. Um, Moody's cited a number of things as positive factors when they were looking at your, your district. The large tax base, the above average income levels, the multi-year uh, operating surpluses leading to a healthy fund balance and stable financial position, growing enrollment, and strong voter support. They listed all those things. I believe you each have, should have a copy there of the report and you can read that at your leisure. But Say some nice things about your district. Obviously, excuse, I think the biggest me, factor. Gary, excuse, excuse me. Could oh. you go through that list one more time? I, I didn't quite hear that. Gary. Okay, the district's large tax base, the above average income levels, the multi year operating surpluses, building up your fund balance gradually over the last several years. That puts you uh, with a healthy, currently with a healthy fund balance and a stable financial position, uh, growing enrollment, and the last one was strong voter support. So they look at all those things, and, and those are all positives for your school district. Uh, the, I think the biggest factor was the gradual improvement in your fund balance. If you go back to 2009, your fund balance was 2.2 million. At the end of 2012, it was 10.1 million. So a sub substantial improvement in your financial position over that short period of time. Um, now getting, getting on to the actual refunding bonds, we're doing this with a little bit different procedure than we would normally do. And that's because your board meeting is tonight and normally we would come and present, we would have taken bids this morning, come and present the bids this evening. However, today is Columbus Day and all the financial markets are closed. So we didn't have the opportunity to take the bids today. So what will happen is we will actually take the bids on Wednesday morning. Um, the, and the results from that then will be determine your actual interest rates. But the interest, the if you look at the resolution you have before you, what it does is we use we call it a parameters resolution. It sets a minimum threshold for the savings on the on the refunding. It says if the if the savings from the refunding hit that target, you receive a positive uh, review from Ellers. Then you're then um, the board chair and the superintendent can accept the proposal on behalf of the board and you won't have to take any further action and we after the sale then we will put together the same kind of information we would normally present the night of the sale and get that and get that so that you all have that information um, the biggest question I guess I have for for you is um, since the sale is on the 16th on Wednesday uh, and it's at 10 o'clock in the morning Sometime in late morning, early afternoon, we'll need to have the people that are going to sign that proposal form available. So we just want to make sure that the superintendent and board chair are available uh, at that time. Otherwise, we would we could select another board member or, or something if we needed to. But if you're both available, that that that's that would be that would work great. Okay. Um, 
I, I take it you can do this, Gary, you can do this electronically? Yes, we will. Okay. What we'll do is we'll fax. Right. We'll fax the form over. It'd be nice if you were both here. We'll fax the form over. You each sign the form. There's two copies. You keep one, fax one back to us, and we don't have to, you know, we don't have to mail stuff back and forth. We can do it all with, uh, with a fax machine. Mm -hmm. If we got the Moody's thing today, does that actually, did that help us for Wednesday sale, knowing the? Absolutely. So we, we might not have gotten that benefit had we bid, had the bid today, because. Well, we, normally we try and schedule the, you know, anytime you issue bonds or, or debt like this, we we end up going through a, a rating process with Moody's that involves a, about an hour long call between Ellers and and the financial, you know, and uh, the district staff and the Moody staff. They go through an analysis, and we schedule that. The underwriters, when they want to, when they bid, they want to see that report before they bid. So normally we try and schedule that report so it's available at least one day prior to the sale. So, um, so you know, it, what would have happened is we would have scheduled, if we could have bid today, we would have hurried up the schedule with Moody's a, a day or two so that we would have had that, that uh, information available. But so that will help with your bids on, on Wednesday. Now, the one thing I will say is the market is very volatile right now, and uh, hopefully we will do well. Um, Back on September 9th, Jody Zespa, one of my colleagues, was here and presented the presale report. At that time, she, the estimate was that we would save about $1,797,000 and it will reduce your property taxes from 2014 through 2019, through that period of time, um, about an equal amount each, each of those years. Um, we did several refundings last week and got very good results, and based on that, Based on the estimates from those kinds of rates that we saw last week, we're thinking that we might be able to save in excess of two million, up a little higher. Now, obviously, the the market's a little volatile. We will continue to watch the market. Um, so, in your resolution, we set that target after consultation with the district at a million and a half. That's still a very nice, you know, savings for your taxpayers. Um, if it looks like something funny happens, you know, we've got all this stuff going on in Washington with the debt limit and and uh, the shutdown of the federal government. If it looked like we weren't going to make those targets, uh, we could do one of two things. If it looks like that's something like that's obvious, something really happens dramatically, let's say tomorrow, we could postpone the sale. Um, and we and if we get bids that we don't like, we can we you can reject all the bids and, and rebid later. But uh, hopefully we won't have to do that. Hopefully we're going to come in with a with a result that's better than that. So what will happen then is on Wednesday, about 10 o'clock, the bids will come in. Sometime between 10, probably between 10 and 10.30, we'll contact Sandy with the results of the sale. And uh, then shortly thereafter, we'll get, that we'll get the proposal form from the underwriters. Um, and then we'll fax that over for signatures from the, from the district staff, from the superintendent and board chair. So it's a little bit different than what we normally do, but again, because of the the bond market being closed today, that's kind of a, another way around, rather than delaying it till your next board meeting or whatever. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that, that plan. What I'd like to um, see if we can do is, is for our next board meeting, since it'll be before the referendum, have somebody present on what we got and what the implications are, because this should have the effect of reducing some tax implications, and Correct. it would be nice to get that information out. And it'll actually reduce the, the tax. It'll actually reduce the taxes and taxes payable 2014. Your board in September certified your proposed levy, and on that was there's part of that debt service levy was for these bond for the bonds that we're refunding. So once the sale actually occurs, we will notify the Department of Education, and they'll revise your debt service levy reduce it for the savings for the taxes payable in 14 and what will happen is then when you certify in December you'll be able to certify at a lower dollar amount on the debt serv existing debt service than you than you currently have in your proposed levy anyone else thank you Gary okay you're welcome now the one thing I will say you do have a resolution obviously on the agenda for the action items and that will call for a roll call vote. Thank you. Thank you. And Sandy, thank you. Uh, since you get slammed if the results are bad, yeah. <laughs> we, when, when the results are as good as these are, 
Well done. Thank you. <laughs> Next item uh, on our agenda is uh, the policy development first readings. Uh, the board will review policy 208, development, adoption, and implementation of policies. This is a first reading on this. This is the policy on policies. So if you're a policy wonk, you're in absolute heaven right now because this is the policy on policies. Uh, this policy has been re reviewed and updated by MSBA in 2010, and changes are reflected in the draft of this policy. Uh, the board has it. Any questions or uh, ideas on this policy? I just have one, and I and I need to check it by the time we come back. But I'm noticing on uh, the change on 5C where we're, the old policy said that the responsibility was the superintendent's or the superintendent's designee to keep the policy manual current, which I liked. The new policy adds several other options with the, with the disjunctive or, and my concern is if anybody can be responsible, perhaps nobody is responsible. And I'm not sure. That doesn't strike me as a wise policy. So if it's mandated by statute, that's one thing. But if that's just MSBA's interpretation and we have some room to modify that, I'd like to take a look at that. Other questions? Okay. We'll move along to uh, the next is the second reading uh, the board will review the following mandated policies as a second reading and will be asked to approve in tonight's action agenda. Policy number 102, equal education opportunity. Policy 214, out of state travel by the school board. And policy 401, equal employment opportunity. Any questions or comments on those policies? Nancy? Yeah, I'll just note that there are no changes proposed, and having read them, I don't see, in my view, any need for any changes. So they're the same policies that we've had. At this point uh, in our agenda, we are into the action agenda. Uh, we have four items on that uh, with the addition of the approval of our candidate for the Human Rights Commission. So uh, the first item on the action agenda is the approval of policies second reading. It is recommended that the board affirm policies that were reviewed at the September 23, 2013 school board meeting, 102 equal educational opportunity, 214 out-of-state travel by the school board, and 401, equal employment opportunity. I'm looking for a motion to approve. So moved. Moved by Nancy. Second? Second. Second by Larry. This does not require a roll call vote. Is there any further discu discussion? Okay. The, call the question. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. We have a 5 0 vote. Next is the approval of the resolution awarding the sale of general obligation school building refunding bonds. Uh, that was a discussion with Gary. It is recommended that the school board approve the sale of the district's $19,220,000 general obligation school building refunding bonds, series 2013A. Um, Need a motion to approve, and this does require a roll call vote. So moved. moved by Jim, second? Second. Second by Nancy. Any further discussion? So for good luck on Wednesday. Yeah. And uh, watching those rates come down is actually, for those of us in finance, has been a real pleasure. It's been really nice to see. Um, Joe, you want to do the roll call vote, please? Shapiro? Aye. Richardson? Aye. Kors? Aye. Yarosh? Aye. Tatalovich? Aye. 5 0. We have a 5 0 vote. Uh, next item is the approval of the resolution authorizing the closing of the Elliott purchase and sale. And uh, 
this this particular resolution, uh, we've had some discussion about it today. Jim, uh, well, let me get the motion on the floor, and then we'll proceed with discussion. Uh, I'll move it. Okay. Uh, it's been moved by Jim. Second. Second. Second by Larry. Uh, discussion. Jim, do you want to speak to it? Yeah. This is all. It's really just a, a cleanup. We've already passed essentially the same motion, uh, but to satisfy some of the real estate transferring um, title standards, we had to explicitly include the legal description of the property, which we have done here. So it's essentially a resolution we've adopted uh, many months ago, probably in, I think, May of 2012, when we uh, entered into the purchase agreement. So this is just kind of a cleanup. So we'll be ready to close uh, if and when at the time we're closing on Elliott School. Thank you. Uh, this one also requires a roll call vote. Uh, Joe, can you walk us down through that? Thank you. Shapiro? Aye. Richardson? Aye. Gores? Aye. Yarosh? Aye. Tatalovich? Aye. We have a 5-0 vote. Last item on the agenda is the approval of the candidate to the St. Louis Park Human Rights Commission. It is recommended that Nicholas McElroy be approved as the St. Louis Park Schools representative on the St. Louis Park Human Rights Commission. Uh, need a motion to that effect? So moved. Moved by Nancy. Second? That would be me. <laughs> <laughs> Since I did the interviewing, I'll second that motion. Uh, any discussion? Um. Since we'll be voting on, on this uh, gentleman, uh, and I don't know much about him, I would, I would like to hear something from Bruce and or Nancy on this. Yeah, just before we met today, uh, Bruce and I had the privilege of, of meeting with and interviewing Nicholas. He's a, he's a uh, now this is, I'm going to show my age here. He's a delightful young man. <laughs> <laughs> he's, I forget how old he is. I'm going to guess uh, he told us, but... Uh, uh, he's been out of he's been out of high school. He's been out of college, and he's working for Ameriprise. So he's got a little bit of experience under his belt, and he's just um, been in St. Louis Park a year or two, not too long, but has been looking for the right way to give back to the community that would resonate with him. And the Human Rights Commission was one of those places, and he um, uh, really hopes to to meet with Rob and a couple other people. And and then we asked what his goals were, and he you know knows he's a new, new guy on the commission, but he said we, he really would like to hear from leaders in, of various of our diverse groups in the city and hear what they feel is going well and what perhaps could be improved and see if there's a role that the commission could play in that. And I thought that was just, you know, the right answer. So um, I was delighted with him and, and he wants to be more. You know, we often appoint people to boards and we never hear back and we don't think to follow up. And I have a feeling with Nick that he's going to want to mutually communicate on this one. And he was also, he's attended a few meetings and he's been, he was involved in the bullying project that was just being concluded by the commission. So he's um, begun to play a role already in this part of our community that in, in, interests him. As Nancy and I sat down and talked to Nick, uh, we, we were impressed. Uh, part of the reason he's moved to St. Louis Park, uh, other than the job, he graduated from Delano High School in 2007, and he uh, was, was very upfront with us, said he had not had very much experience uh, in a community as diverse as ours. And so he, he was upfront with that, uh, but it was part of what he was looking forward to, to getting into the community. He's lived here for two years, and uh, he, he has been active in the community and trying to get more active. The thing that I go to from a leadership perspective is what his values were. We asked that right off the, the bat, and uh, the ones he listed were trust, responsibility, and honesty. And uh, I like those. Uh, in, a, in a short interview with someone, you know, you, you want to dig into the background and find out what kind of person he is. And uh, graduated from high school, attending uh, St. Cloud Tech. Uh, moving uh, in, into, he was with a software company for a number of years, and then he went to Ameriprise. Ameriprise is a good organization and uh, checks their people out fairly carefully. And so uh, we were pleased with the interview. Um, 
He's, he's into hockey, uh, played some junior hockey, and then listed as one of his heroes as one of the school principals uh, at Delano. And so I, I, was, uh, I always like to know who the mentors are, uh, who has shaped his experience. And uh, the, this particular principal, interestingly enough, is now a principal over in Edina. So uh, as Nancy said, and I'll build on that, uh, we, we, we haven't followed up with a lot of our appointments. Uh, and this is one that should be very interesting, and he seems very proactive. So I, I'm going to be interested to watch how he does uh, and what he does. And uh, the anti-bullying campaign, I think, was a good place to start because he got he interacted uh, with the members of the Human Rights Commission and bringing the movie Bully uh, into the district was, was part of, uh, they were active as we were involved in that and it was a, a really good thing for the community. So I think in a nutshell, Nancy and I highly recommend this young man. Any other questions? All those in favor of Nicholas McElroy to be approved uh, for the as our representative on the St. Louis Park Human Rights Commission, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. We have a 5-0 vote. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we'll have communications and transmittals. Um, just want to give a, a quick recognition to the boys soccer team finished their season on Saturday. It's kind of heartbreaking fashion as most uh, playoffs are, I suppose. Um, but they were, I believe, 12-2-2 and two this year and ranked in the top 10 in the state. So they had a very um, solid year. Uh, they were undefeated in the North Suburban Conference in the last week of um, the season. They beat Benilde 6 to nothing. so that's always a great thing to have happen. Um, so um, I look, I, you know, I look forward to watching their games every, every year. Uh, very well coached by Chato, and um, unfortunate that they didn't get further, but it shouldn't diminish a great, uh, great season. We touched a, we, we touched a, a little bit on it uh, uh, on the technology. Uh, uh, event this Saturday, last Saturday. And one thing that I struck me is uh, I did talk to some of the Cargill grant teachers about going into the elementary school. After all, these are high school teachers who chose to teach high school and not go in. And and just to get their honest perspective about what, you know, are they do they feel like they're making a difference? And I would say that they, as they looked around the room, they went in and they had every kid engaged and they were looking and that they were kind of treated as heroes when they came in and the kids saw what was on tap for today, the excitement they get. And I, and I appreciate that, the way we can get kids excited about science and, you know, it, as an early age as possible, give it ideas of careers. I mean, that's something that we need to continue to push for all kids. Um, and so I think that's a, a good avenue to try. and, and uh, and we'll see if we can, if it's worthwhile, and I hope we measure it, that if this grant money ever runs out, we figure out a way to keep making it happen if we think it's making a difference. And at least anecdotally, uh, from the teacher's perspective, uh, I'd like to hear from the kids too, but from the teacher's perspective, they're reaching a lot of these kids and they, they feel the excitement when they're there, so. I was just going to comment on a card that was in our packet. Um, I don't know if you can get a close-up of it, but it says it's early childhood screening time. So you're probably, are these being mailed out, Rob, do you know? They're being mailed out, but I'll just reemphasize it. If you have a child is, who's three, it's time to call and arrange for an early childhood screening. It's a screening that helps identify any health or de developmental concerns so that there's an opportunity to work with those uh, in, the, in the time before school starts. And it's uh, it's a free service. It's required by the state of Minnesota. So I don't know if Tammy or anyone else over there wants to say more, but the number is 952-928-6726. It's 952-928-6726. So if you live in St. Louis Park and you have a three-year-old, give them a call. Want to add anything else, Tammy? Thumbs up. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, the, the one thing I would like to mention is uh, a week ago Saturday, uh, there was the fundraiser that we had at um, 
the, uh, it was at the winery in St. Louis Park. Now, I don't know how many of you have been over on Cambridge Avenue in that warehouse district. I would not have believed how neat this place was. It was really fun. Um, I, it, was, it was just a great fundraiser. I, I think we, we cleared about $15,000 uh, out of the fundraiser. Uh, and and what, what really amazed me, Rob and I were there, a uh, number of others were there. It, it was just a great time. But uh, the fun part was about halfway through the night, I looked around and I said, gee, these are all my friends. And, <laughs> and they were just such a wonderful group of people. The people from STEP were there. The people from the foundation were there. Uh, the people who gave a lot of money were there. And it was just a wonderful group. And the food was absolutely fantastic. It was just great. So great beer, great wine, and great food. And uh, all in all, a wonderful evening. And our uh, Public Schools Foundation uh, gives money to so many great things. And, Going back to the technology fair, one of the th first things I sat down uh, with the, the teachers from PSI who had put together their Spanish curriculum that they not only do with the kids in the computer lab and that they share with the other schools, but they do it for the parents. Because the parents will always come and say, well, what can we do? Of course, you can take some kind of Spanish class. But if they learn with the kids, because this interactive program is so good, it came from, uh, I believe it was the University of Georgia or the Georgia Public Schools. And they, they created it. Our teachers created it. But then they got input from all the public schools around the country. It's a wonderful program. So if you want to learn some Spanish, you can go to the website and pick it up and learn it yourself. And, and I was just so impressed by that. And then I sat down with two young ladies uh, from Aquila who were doing uh, their project that, that was just out of this world on working with words and working with poetry. It was the integration of poetry, the, the visual arts, the 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 sounds of the poetry, and then how they put the art together with the poetry is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And I, I was just, I'm so impressed with our kids, and especially, I, I love the IB curriculum, and, and <laughs> when, they, when they do their reflections, I just love how they do it. They kind of look off into the, the distance and reflect, and I, I just find <laughs> that so powerful, and, and I, I truly enjoy it. So uh, I had a great time at the technology fair and a great time uh, a week ago Saturday uh, with this fundraiser. It's always a wonderful event. With that, we will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Nancy, second by Jim. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And we are adjourned. Good night, everybody. <laughs>